Well, thank you, Jim. Great to be in the house of the Lord here this morning. Looking at all these fine people that are here on Labor Day weekend. You did not go away. You stayed here, and I just love that. We're all here together. That's just great, isn't it? It's hard to believe that it's already Labor Day. It's already September. Can you imagine? I just really haven't adjusted. But I know as this morning uh, I was up early and as I looked outside, I noticed just how dark it was and I thought to myself, it's definitely not June anymore. It is really changing and it's changing quickly. However, if you love summer, you'll be happy to know that it's 90s all week long and very high humidity. So have at it. I can't wait for winter. Anyway, take your Bibles this morning, would you, and turn with me, please, to Mark chapter 6. Mark, the sixth chapter this morning, we're talking about putting our needs in perspective. And this morning, as uh, we're dealing with this passage, we're actually uh, in kind of a part two as we've been looking here at Mark chapter six. In the first part of this uh, journey here in dealing with the needs of others, we were addressing the situation that takes place uh, in verse uh, 33 and going on down through 44, and that's known as the feeding of the 5,000. And we would understand that to be 5,000 men and many more thousand women and children that Jesus fed there. And what Jesus was doing is so unique because we pick this up where the disciples have gathered with Jesus in verse 30 of this passage and reported to him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while. Because there were so many people coming and going, they didn't even have time to eat. And so we get this uh, scenario of these busy apostles and they uh, get into the boat, going off to a secluded place by themselves with Jesus. However, the people, as you may remember from last Sunday, they saw the boat and they could see around the Sea of Galilee. And so they anticipated where they were going. By the time Jesus steps out on the boat, out of the boat onto the shore, there's thousands of people waiting to hear what is going to happen. And the disciples, after time went by, said, Jesus, turn to these people, please, and send them away so that they can go out into the villages and find something to eat, and we can get some peace and quiet. And Jesus says, you feed them something. And they thought to themselves, how in the world are we going to be able to feed this many people? And Jesus does this tremendous miracle, and Jesus feeds all of these thousands of people, including the opportunity there uh, to feed them. And there's 12 baskets left over, and someone pointed out to me that Jesus was the only one that didn't have some food that day. But here we are, we're looking at this passage, and it's interesting, but following this, we have the passage where Jesus walks on the water. And that starts here in verse 45, and we see that as we look at this, if you look at verse 51, he got into the boat with them, the wind stopped, they were utterly astonished, for they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves. So what we're finding is that these two passages are commingled, and Jesus is trying to teach a very, very important point. Would you stand with me, please? I want to read this passage of Scripture, starting there in verse 45. The Bible says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side to Bethesda. And while he himself was sending the crowd away after bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. And when it was evening, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. And seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them, at about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, and he intended to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost, and they cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke with them and said to them, Take courage, it's I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind stopped. And they were utterly astonished, for they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. Father, we ask that our hearts today would be pliable. That, Father, we would be open to the teaching of our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
May the word of God this morning penetrate hard hearts, for Lord, all of us seem at times to have a hardness to our hearts. Open our hearts today. Teach us your truths, I pray, that we might be more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray this in his precious name. Amen. You may be seated. At this point in time, in Mark chapter 6, the interesting aspect here is that the disciples are now recognizing their own needs. If you think back, you look at the passage that we dealt with last Sunday, and the Bible says uh, that the people, as it was getting late, uh, verse 35, the disciples came to Jesus and said, this place is desolate and it's already quite late. Send them away so that they can go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. There was no denying that the people who had come to Jesus for his teaching had, had serious needs. Now, the biggest part of their need was not physical, but it was rather spiritual. But this physical need was so great, they were so hungry that it was perhaps blocking them from being able to concentrate and listen to the teachings of Jesus. And so we have a couple of different dynamics that are playing out here. The disciples are looking at the crowd and they're saying to themselves, send them away. And basically their concern was not so much for the crowd as it was for themselves. We need to understand that. That's an important component here. It wasn't that their hearts were going out to these people. A lot like Jesus, who the Bible says as he looked upon the crowd, he saw the crowd and he was moved with compassion towards them. That's not the same scenario in the hearts of the disciples. They just wanted to get a vacation. Can I hear that? I mean, just a vacation day. They just wanted to get away from the crowds. That's why they'd gotten this crazy boat and gone across the Sea of Galilee in the first place. There wasn't even enough time to eat, the Bible says. And it was Jesus' idea to take them from there and get them to this other remote area where they could rest. Funny thing happens. Because all of a sudden, when it has gotten late and Jesus is fed all of these people, the Bible says in verse 45, he made his disciples get into the boat. And the word there, he made them, was it was somewhat forcible on Jesus' part. In other words, understand this, the disciples didn't want to leave Jesus even for a moment. And Jesus said, no, I insist. So they get into the boat and they begin to row to the other side, Bethesda, and Jesus is sending the crowd away. I'll talk more about that here in a moment. Uh, he's going to send the crowd away, and he bids the disciples farewell, and after the crowd is dispersed, he then goes up into the mountain to pray. Now here's the predicament of the disciples. Verse 47, when it was evening, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. So Jesus is alone on the land. He's in the mountain actually praying, and Jesus looks down and he sees them straining at the oars for the wind was against them. And it's about the fourth watch of the night. Now the fourth watch of the night is none, is none other than 3 a.m. approximately. So you get the picture here. Uh, these disciples have been rowing for hours. Seems like that's their lot. You know what I mean? Uh, didn't this just happen? Uh, when they were going across and uh, the, the boat was filling up with water and they cried out for Jesus to help them. The interesting thing is they didn't understand the lesson that Jesus was trying to teach them on that particular nautical journey. And so this, this three-hour tour, as it were, uh, is turning into something much longer and much more difficult. Maybe this time they'll learn their lesson. Maybe this time their hearts won't be so hardened. You say, well, Pastor Kevin, what's the lesson that Jesus is trying to teach them? That's the big question, isn't it? They're rowing this boat. It's the middle of the night. And they're rowing for all they are worth. Because the wind is so pronounced their bow is there into the wind. And I'm telling you what, I've told the story before, but boy, this brings back a very graphic memory in my mind. 
when it was about four o'clock in the morning and we were trying to row across a little bit of water. And uh, my buddy was rowing, and I still remember my hands being there on this little rowboat that we were in, probably a 12-foot, uh, you know, Sears and Roebuck special. And uh, as the wave would come up and the bow would go up in the air, my hands were dipping under the water, and it was January, and, uh, and it was in Massachusetts. <laughs> And uh, my hands were going underneath, and I'm thinking, this boat is starting to fill with water, is it not? I didn't even want to look down. Uh, But I remember so clearly saying, you know, can't we turn around? And the point is, you can't turn around. Because the wind is at your bow, you want to keep your bow facing into the wind. It's at that point that if you tried to turn around, now there was a time when they could have turned around, but they didn't turn around. And so now their bow is in the wind, and if they were trying to turn now, they would capsize. The wind would be too much, the waves would be too much, and so they would capsize, and all lives would likely be lost. And so they have nothing else to do except keep the bow into the wind and row as hard as you can. And yes, the bow is going way up and way down. It is a very difficult time. I have a question for you this morning. You remember the crowd that was hungry? They had needs. Jesus looked at their needs. He saw their physical need and he saw their spiritual need. Who has a need now? The disciples, don't they? My stars, they're going to perish. It's deja vu all over again. Same bunch of guys in the middle of the same blooming Sea of Galilee, and it looks like they're going to find the bottom this time. You see, they had a predicament. They had a need. And the only one who could meet that need was a miracle worker. You see, here we see the preciousness of the deliverer. Only Jesus is able to deliver them. They're far from shore, miles really. There's no way for help. There's no Coast Guard rescue diver who's going to jump out of a helicopter at 100 feet and plunge into the water and swim over and lift them out with a basket. It's just not going to happen. What happens here is nothing short of a miracle in itself. And we look at this passage and we understand that Jesus sees them straining at the oars. And he came to them, the Bible says, walking on the sea. And and my scripture here says in verse 48, he intended to pass by them. And that's a poor translation there. He was coming alongside them is what it should say. And the reaction of the disciples when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost. That's the word we get the word phantom from. They were thinking to themselves, what is this now that we're seeing? It's at this point that they recognize that it's Jesus. Jesus says to them, take courage, it's I. Do not be afraid. At this point, Peter would get out of the boat and actually try to walk to Jesus. But what point that Mark is making here is that when the need was enormous, spiritually among the multitudes they looked at themselves and they saw their own need as greater than the multitudes and now what jesus is doing is he is highlighting their own need and it is reflected on the backdrop of people who have tremendous tremendous spiritual needs and what this would do is it would teach them a vital lesson about the mission that they were called to embark on. Remember that time. Clearly, the disciples are there with the crowd and they come to Jesus. Jesus, send them away. And I would say, oh, don't you dare send them away. Feed them so that Jesus can continue to teach them and invite them to be followers of his. I came across this excerpt of a Billy Graham invitation he said jesus said come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden i do the billy graham accent right now but it's really be bad (laughs) he says i will give you rest since the early dawn of mankind's history when our eden of bliss became a desert of discord we've been creatures of restlessness 
when we are bereft of the peace that comes from God through the saving grace of Christ, we become fish out of water. Divorce, alcoholism, immorality are direct results of the restlessness of sin. This diabolical unrest has permeated our nation like a contagious disease and has become the underlying cause of domestic community and social problems. The basic cause of our nat national immorality is this spiritual unrest in people's lives today. Christ could solve the problems of the many celebrities who have made headlines because of their marital difficulties. If the principals in a domestic brawl were to accept Christ, not only would their sins be forgiven, but Christ would help them solve their problems. Psychologists schooled in the intricate workings of the mind are confessing that psychology is helpless to solve all of the mental and nervous disturbances of people today. Sociologists trained in the interactions of society are admitting that sociology cannot cope with the tremendous problems in human relationships. Political leaders point out the moral ills of America, but none of them seem to have an answer to the desperate need for a new moral integrity that would reverse the moral plunge that Americans are taking. Many political leaders privately admit that they are unable to cope with the seriousness of the moral dilemma. In my travels about the country, I've sensed unrest in almost every phase of our modern day living. This changeable, unsettled, roving, transient, sleepless, and fidgety spirit is due primarily to the restlessness of the human heart and its separation from the Christ of tranquility and peace. These insecure individuals could find spiritual peace and physical rest by surrendering their lives to Jesus Christ. The Bible says the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. In the morning you shall say, oh, that it were evening. In the evening you'll say, oh, that it were morning. Deuteronomy 28. Every day I come in contact, he said, with mixed up paradoxical men and women, rich people who are held in the grip of insecurity, intellectual people who have lost their way, strong people who live in fear of weakness and defeat. I long to take every one of them by the hand and lead them into the presence of the Savior who said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I love that last statement where Billy Graham said, I long to take every one of them by the hand and lead them into the presence of the Savior who said, Come unto me, all ye that labor are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My friends, that's the words of Jesus as he offers that to the multitude. The disciples failed to grasp that message. They failed to see the tremendous spiritual needs of the multitude, and they were consumed by their own needs, and they were not interested then in seeking to meet the needs of others. And what Jesus is teaching them is that we all have needs, don't we? We all have this spiritual neediness. And here they are in the middle of this boat, in the middle of, or in the, yeah, they're on the middle of the boat, but they're in this boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus is showing them, you have tremendous needs yourselves right now. And only I can come in and deliver you. And Jesus is the answer, not only for the disciples, but for the world. And at that point, the disciples, I believe, come to understand the needs of the world. The predicament of man is well documented. And as I just got through reading, the predicament of man is, is so significant. Notice with me, if you take your Bibles and flip over to John chapter 6. John chapter 6 goes right in hand in hand with Mark chapter 6. And it records some different elements here. We have in this passage of Scripture what is exactly taking place. Go with me to John 6 and verse 22. Because it picks it up the day after Jesus stills the Sea of Galilee. The next day, the Bible says, the crowd that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other small boat there. What ended up happening was when Jesus got into the boat and the sea was calmed, the Bible says they were immediately at land to which they were going. Do you see that there in verse 21? So understand the miracle. Another miracle. Another great miracle. All of a sudden, Jesus gets into the boat and the boat's no longer in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. It's on shore. Boom. Just like that. Again, Jesus' miracles are beyond time and space. And the people are looking at that, and they see that there's one boat over there, and they're trying to figure out how Jesus 
got over there not using a boat because they saw all the disciples leave on a boat. And the Bible says when they found him, verse 25, they said, Rabbi, when did you get here? Or basically, how did you arrive here like this? It was a miracle. Jesus answered and said, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Now, that's very significant. There were a lot of signs that Jesus did. Would you agree with that? This is going to highlight the predicament of humanity. All of the signs of Jesus. Stop and think about all of the miracles that Jesus has done. He has raised the dead. Woo-hoo! I mean, you know. He's healed people, he's made the blind to see, he's fed 5,000, he's done all of these different things, and what's the one miracle that stands out? The 5,000 being fed. You seek me, not because of the signs that you've seen, the other miracles that you've seen. Even stilling the sea, I mean, being able to control nature, casting out thousands of demons from an individual who was well-known and greatly feared. Even now, breaking the barriers of time and space and all of a sudden demonstrating that to you. But none of those are as important as this one. You ate of the loaves and you were satisfied. You were filled. Jesus would go on and say, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. You see what's happening here? The people are focused on the food. Now, those of us who like to eat are oftentimes focused on the food, but there's a bigger meaning here. They are focused on what is here and now. They're focused on this life and their needs here. They are not thinking about their spiritual predicament. They're only looking at their physical predicament. Now, this is what you want to remember. This lifestyle that the people have is a subsistent lifestyle, meaning that every day pushes you one farther one day further down the road you don't have enough for tomorrow you are totally subsistent and you're dependent upon what you're doing today to be able to eat tomorrow they don't have the lifestyle that you and i have Uh, we're planning to go to the grocery store and you're going to go and you're going to spend some money and you're going to get everything that you need they're not able to do that They have to grow it all right there, and they don't know how it's going to be provided for them. In fact, they would go back and they would reference the manna that uh, was received. Remember that manna? I mean, they're rejoicing about this manna because uh, God gave the manna every single day. They were looking at it like Moses had given them the manna, and Moses had done that. And Jesus corrects them and says, no, 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 God the Father gave you that manna. And I'm thinking to myself, yes, this is the same manna that that you hated and you complained about. Do you remember that? I mean, it's like now they're rejoicing. Oh, remember the good old days when we had all this great food to eat on a daily basis and and i just want to wring their little collars and say wait a minute read the rest of the story you guys hated that stuff after time they're looking at what jesus has done he made them some wonderful food and they're thinking to themselves wow this is truly truly incredible so much so that they were ready notice verse 15 here in john chapter 6 They were ready to take Jesus by force to make him king. That's how fired up they were about being fed. They were thinking to themselves, let's make him king because if he's the king and he can provide for us, we're going to be all set and we're finally going to have our physical needs met. Critical problem here is they're missing the most important point. And that is their physical needs are small compared to their spiritual needs. And Jesus would say to them uh, that in verse 27, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father God has set his seal. And they said, what shall we do? That we might work the works of God. What are we we supposed to do? And Jesus' reply is, this is the work of God. If you want to do the work of God, this is it. Believe in Jesus. Believe in him whom he has sent. Namely, Jesus here is speaking about himself. He calls them to place their faith 
in him. What happens after this is a turning point in the ministry of Jesus. It's an enormously important point. Because after Jesus says this, uh, Jesus would say in verse 40, This is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I'll raise him up on the last day. And in verse 41, the Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. And this is what they're saying. Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? Do you remember who else said those same things about Jesus? It was the people in his own hometown. Do you remember? What do you mean put our faith in him? We've known him since he was just a little kid. He can't possibly have done all these great things. He can't possibly be the Messiah. See, as Jesus looked at these people, he recognized that they were a long way from placing their faith in him. And he said, do not grumble, verse 43, among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I'll raise him up on the last day. There was no logic to it. Jesus wasn't asking them to, to, to put all of the, the points together. He was realizing that there was spiritual interaction from God the Father that was going to have to intervene in order for these people to see their spiritual need. At this point in time, they are still invested heavily in their self-righteousness. They look upon themselves and they think to themselves when they're condescending towards Jesus and saying, oh, aren't you the son of Mary and Joseph? What they're saying is, how can you possibly be the savior of the world? We're as good as you are. We grew up in the same area. And as Jesus looked at these people, thousands of them, you start to understand why he is moved to compassion because most of these people standing in front of him are refusing to place their faith in Jesus, refusing to place their faith in him. And their eternity will not be heaven, but rather it will be hell. And his heart is breaking over the needs of these people. You see, for those of us today, we need to lift up our eyes and we need to see that there is so much at stake. The world today needs to hear the good news of, of the Savior. Jesus would go on. He would speak to them in spiritual terms. He would talk to them about being flesh and, and blood, and you must partake of my flesh and blood. It's interesting that the Catholic Church, whose hermeneutic is always allegorizing things, chooses to take that literally. I have no idea why. But when Jesus taught that, people said, What? They miss the whole aspect of the spiritual. And the Bible says here that the disciples, these who are following Jesus, said this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? Verse 60. And verse 66 says, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So much so that Jesus would look to the 12 in verse 67 and says, you do not want to go away also, do you? And then you have Simon Peter's great confession. Where would we go? We believe that you are the one true God. All but Judas would believe that about Jesus. Jesus is truly the precious Savior, is he not? He's the one who's come to seek and to save that which is lost. And Jesus is teaching here in this passage that everyone, everyone's needs are important to him. But the spiritual needs outweigh the physical needs. Jesus is teaching as well uh, that disciples, uh, all of the teaching of the disciples that while our needs may be important, that they don't outweigh the needs of others. When we look at the world, we oftentimes, because we're so consumed with ourselves and we are very much like the crowd, we are much more interested in what is going on in our world today than we are looking at the spiritual needs of others. Can we be honest about that this morning? Isn't that true about all of us? We spend more time thinking about ourselves than we do the lost. Do you get up in the morning and pray for the lost? 
You think about the needs of, of others? Aren't you so glad that Jesus thought of you? You see, what the lesson is all about here is Jesus saying to the disciples, remember that need you had? That scary night in the middle of the Sea of Galilee? I came and rescued you. And it's the same thing that needs to happen to the hearts of mankind. They need to be rescued from their unbelief. And while we all do have the needs, we've got things going on in our world and, and there is no question about that. Jesus will meet our needs just as he gave the 12 baskets to the disciples. But understand that Jesus wants us to focus on the needs of others. Jesus demonstrates here an urgency when dealing with those who lack faith because he knows the opportunities are fleeting. Thousands of people are before him. They are in this remote area and he has the opportunity to do a miracle to feed them so that they stay there and listen to the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that can transform their lives. Is that worth it? Better believe it is. Especially in Jesus' mind, because what does Jesus know that we didn't know? What does Jesus know that the others didn't know? They had no idea that the masses would reject Jesus' teaching. They were interested in making Jesus king as long as he was going to put bread on their table. If, as long as it was financially sound. It's kind of the same thing now. We vote for people, well, what are you going to do for me financially? I mean, are you going to give me this? Are you going to give me that? I mean, can I get something here? Jesus knew that these people would turn their backs on him when he shares with them the spiritual reality that they need to come, cast off their self-righteousness, and place their faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. It's a big lesson for us to learn. Let us not be as the disciples were when Jesus finds them in the boat with hearts that were still hardened towards the needs of others. Let's look at our own needs and be thankful that Jesus Christ has saved us from the penalty of our sin, amen? And look at others who are in need and take the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. Let's pray. If you're here this morning and you've yet to place your faith in Jesus Christ, understand